Uh, so as we are in uh, our missions emphasis uh, today, uh, we are going to continue talking about missions. We're going to continue to talk about um, just the goal of sharing the gospel with the world. Uh, we have opportunities in ABF to continue that thought process to see what our missionaries are doing, uh, to hear from someone going on the field, and it's going to be a, a great privilege that we're going to have. Uh, so for today, I, I want us to come back and remember something super important about missions. Because I think sometimes in our, in our world today and in our church today, and I would say probably even in our personal lives, we forget uh, that everything that we do and everything that God has called us to do uh, is not about us being strong enough, but it's about Jesus being strong enough. And, and we're going to talk about that today. I know Pastor Justin last week talked about how prayer and God's word are two key elements in, in seeing the mission go forward, seeing the gospel be preached. And you're going to hear a lot of some of the very similar things today uh, as we maybe look at it in a few different passages uh, of, uh, of the Bible. So we are going to be taking a little bit of a journey today. Uh, I want to start with a little bit of an illustration. We were just on vacation. We went to Boston. Uh, was one of our stops, and we got to see a lot of historical places. And one of the places we went, if you are familiar, is the USS Constitution, which is, uh, or Old Ironsides, if you might know it by that name. Uh, historical boat, uh, warship that we were able to tour, and uh, it, was, it was incredible as we're walking around, and you know, you're reading the signs and hearing people talk about the ship, and, and how you're looking up and you see these massive masts and these huge sails, and you're realizing like just how much things have changed, and like that ship was completely dependent upon the wind to move. If it, needed to win, if it needed to move into a battle position, they needed to use, the, use the, uh, the sails to get the wind to take them where they needed to go. If they needed to retreat, they needed the wind to push them away. If they were going on a mission, they needed the wind to take them where they were going. And it was very interesting as we watched that and thought that through and like how dependent upon the wind those ships really were. And that's why when there was a storm, you really couldn't do anything because the wind uh, wouldn't cooperate. And so uh, as much training as all those sailors had, as much battle training they had, as much as they knew how to use the equipment and use the sails, at the end of the day, it wasn't their power or their abilities really that would get the ship from point A to point B. The only thing that would get them from point A to point B was the power of the wind, something outside of their control, and yet they could do things that would help the wind guide them. But at the end of the day, if there was no wind, they were in trouble, and the wind would be what would take them. And as I thought about that, it was interesting, because as we're on vacation, I know I'm going to be preaching, so my mind is weird, and so I'm always looking for like stuff, illustrations and things. And I know what I was thinking about was, I want to talk about how the power of missions it does not rely upon us, but the power of missions is only found in the power of Jesus. And I think there's some very common uh, verses that we read every time we do missions emphasis or every single time we talk about evangelism, and we go to those verses and we just kind of blurt them out, use them, and they become almost, we take them for granted. But there's a couple of things that I want to point out today as we look at some popular passages and maybe some others you haven't looked at in a while that will help us to understand that when we talk about missions, evangelism, extending the gospel to the world, it is we as Christians, our role in all of this is to trust and lean into the power that God provides. And that's what we're going to look at today. Just as the sailors would, would rely on the wind, we need to rely on God. So we're going to start by uh, introducing this by talking about the church's purpose. Now, no doubt many of you have heard this before, uh, and we're going to go to Matthew 28, uh, 18 through 20. Uh, So the church's purpose is seen here in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, as Jesus is leaving his disciples behind, and he gives them a commission. The Great Commission is what we've come to call it, Uh, and what we are going to see in this verse is that the church of Jesus has one purpose. The church of Jesus has one purpose, and that is to make disciples of the whole world. So let's read, uh, and uh, we're going to be in 18 through 20, but right now I just want to read verses 19 and 20. These are the verses that we are commonly used to hearing, and it says this in verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age." 
No doubt these verses are so powerful for us to understand our purpose. That our purpose is to make disciples, to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them. And that's by, by preaching the gospel, seeing people baptized, teaching God's word. That is how discipleship happens. And we do that as God is with us, as Jesus remains with us. And, and so we know that to be true, that the church of Jesus does have one purpose, is to make disciples. And let's notice here that, yes, he's talking to his disciples that are on the earth at the time, but as we look at all of Scripture, this verse does not just apply to a very few people. This verse, this calling, this purpose, is the purpose of the church. And when I say the church, I don't mean Alfred Allman Bible Church. I mean everyone uh, that has accepted Jesus as Savior and is following him with their lives. That is the church of Jesus. It's the body of Christ. Is everyone who has given their lives to Jesus. And so all of the church is called to the mission of making disciples of all the nations. Every single one of us sitting here is included in that the church as a whole is responsible to see this happen. It's not just, hey, there's a few uh, normal people and then really, really spiritual people like missionaries that go around the world and share the gospel. We all play a part because we are all called to the same purpose. Now, that's important for us to know, but I want us to go back to verse 18 when we read this passage. And what we're going to see as we go back to verse 18 is this. The pur- this purpose that we know we have can only be accomplished through the power and authority of Jesus himself. Again, Matthew 28, now going back 18 through 20, this is what it says. And Jesus and came, came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore. Now, we've said this before, and this is old and not funny anymore, but there's a, if there's a therefore, it's there for some reason, right? So what is the therefore, therefore? Well, the therefore is there because Jesus just said, I have all authority over everything. My authority knows no bounds. Go, therefore, out of that authority, knowing that I am in control, go forward and make disciples. You see, we can isolate verse 19 and say this is just a, a, a command that God gives and he's like, you've got to go out and you've got to start preaching the gospel. And yes, it is a command. I'm not saying it's not. But at the same time, it is anchored in the truth that Jesus has all authority over everything. In other words, Jesus has the power. Jesus is going to give the power. He has the authority over everything. And so now, because we know that, we can go forward and preach the gospel, see people baptized, make disciples. We do that not in our own power, but because of the authority and power of Jesus. We see that in Matthew 28, 18. So as we understand the Great Commission, it is more than just a command. It is also a promise. Jesus is saying, because I'm in control, because I have authority, you are going to go make disciples. That is what Jesus is saying to us as his followers. And then again, at the end, reminds us again that I am with you always to the end of the age. He physically returns to heaven, but he is still with us. And therefore, because he is with us and he has all authority, then the nations will be reached and disciples will be made. So the church's purpose, we see, is to make disciples, and we only do that through the power of Jesus. And so today, as that is our introduction, what I want to talk about is Jesus doing three things for us. Three things for his church that will help us persevere in this great purpose. Because I'm not sitting here saying that uh, sharing the gospel and going out and making disciples is an easy job. It indeed is hard. There's many things that we might have to sacrifice in order to live a life that is showing Jesus to the world and speaking his truth to the world, speaking the gospel to the world. There will be sacrifices and it is not easy and therefore we must persevere. The word persevere is about keep on keeping on. If it wasn't hard, the Bible wouldn't tell us so many times throughout its pages to persevere in our faith. And we know that perseverance is hard, and yet Jesus gives us three things in his word that we can look at today that should help us when times get tough, when we need to persevere uh, in sharing the gospel, when we need to persevere in living a life that is worthy of the gospel, when we find the heart, when it gets hard, Jesus has done and said many things that'll help us to get through that time, to persevere, to know Jesus, and to stay strong and keep on keeping on even when things get hard. Jesus will help us, and that's what we're gonna see through three points today as we look at scripture. The first thing we're going to see today is that in Scripture we see that Jesus prays for the church. He prayed for the church. We see that 
in, in John 17 is where we're going to be. Jesus prays for the church. It's important for us to know right now, as we sit here, Jesus prayed, as we see in John 17, and continues to pray, to talk to God the Father on our behalf, to intercede for us, but Jesus prays for the church. We talked last week about how important prayer is in the, in the work of missions. Well, Jesus is the great example of that. He, this prayer in John 17, it, it, it prays a lot of things. God, Jesus says a lot of things about the church that he's going to be leaving behind after he dies. After he dies, resurrects, and goes back to heaven. He's going to be leaving a church behind, and he's praying for us. He's praying for those that are with him right at that moment, but he also says, I pray for all those who are coming after them. And so Jesus prays for us. So when we are faced with hardship, we can know that Jesus prayed for us, but why did he pray for us? What we're going to see is that he prayed that missions would happen. In a, it's, a long, it's a long prayer. There's lots of things he says, but at the end of the day, he's praying that missions will happen. So let's look at this prayer in John 17 as we start thinking about what Jesus shows us through his prayer. So the first thing we're going to see as we read these first few verses is that Jesus has authority to give eternal life through the work he is accomplishing on earth. So let's see that in John 17, 1 through 5. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Jesus starts his prayer that many have called the high priestly prayer by thanking God for the authority that was given to him over all things, over all flesh, that Jesus is the way that eternal life is given. We see here that Jesus has authority to give eternal life through the work that he is accomplishing on earth. What is the work that Jesus is accomplishing on earth? Well, at this moment, it's him teaching about the kingdom of God. It's about his, the miracles that he's doing to confirm the teaching about the, the, the kingdom of God. And we also understand that Jesus is talking because he knows what's about to happen. This isn't just about the past. This is about the, the near future. This is the gospel. The work that Jesus did as he came to the earth as God, became a man, uh, lived a perfect life for our sake because we couldn't We couldn't live that life. He died on the cross to purchase forgiveness for the sins that we've committed and the death that we deserve, as we see all the way back in Genesis. And that sin and death that has overtaken us, Jesus died on the cross to provide forgiveness for that sin after living that perfect life and teaching what it meant to follow God. Then he rose again three days later, and he ascended to God, and he's waiting to come back one day. That is the gospel message, that we our sin and... uh, And our rebellion has carried us away from relationship with God. In order for that to be restored, Jesus had to live, die, resurrect, and wait and and go back to heaven to wait for us. That is the gospel, the good news. That is what Jesus is doing, and it's eternal life comes through that. Eternal life comes through that. And so the gospel is what needs to be shared because the gospel is what Jesus did to bring eternal life to all people who will receive it. And so that God will be glorified through what Jesus has done. And so we see that here in John 17, 1 through 5. This is another reminder that Jesus has authority over everything. He has eternal over all flesh. He has, eternal to give, he has power and authority to give eternal life. And he is the only one who can give eternal life. And so in this prayer, he reminds us, even as he prays to God the Father, he prays and thanks God for the authority that he was given to be able to bring eternal life to us, which is the purpose and the hope of missions. Not only do we see Jesus pray about his authority, but Jesus prays for protection from the sinful world through God's truth. In John 17, 6 through 19, Jesus moves on in his prayer. And I know this is a little lengthy, but I want you to hear what Jesus is praying for you and for me. What Jesus is praying for his church. John 17, 6 through 19. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of this world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know truth that I came from you, and that they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours." 
All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. Jesus says here, he prays for protection from the sinful world that will no doubt... During our missions, when we're going forward to preach the gospel, to make disciples, as that happens, we're going to find opposition from the world because as the world hated Jesus, they will hate us. Because we're not of this world. There's a difference. We live for a different world, which is eternity, eternity, eternal life. That's what we live for. That's what Jesus lived for. And so we're not of this world in that sense. And so although we're still in the world, we are not of the world. We are different than the world, and therefore we will be hated. And if we are hated, Jesus says, please protect them. But how are we protected? We're protected through the word of God. The protection and strength we need for the mission, as Pastor Justin reminded us of last week, it's not only through our prayer, but it's through the word of God itself. That God has given us words that we listen to and we obey, and as we do that, we will be protected from the evil one. We will be able to live a life in which we are on mission, bringing the gospel to the nations, not because we're strong enough to fight for ourselves, but because we have someone else fighting for us, and that is God himself. Jesus has promised, he's prayed that we will be protected by the word of God. And so we need to know the word of God. We need to trust the word of God. We need to give ourselves to the Bible that he has given us, the words that he has given us, so that when the world attacks, when we are hated, when we need to persevere, we can run to what he's told us and trust him and his word. And Jesus says, the battle with sin will be won through the word of truth, God's word to us. So as Jesus prays, he prays, for author- he prays about the authority that he has. He prays for protection from the sinful world through God's truth. And finally, he prays for unity in the mission of glorifying and making God's name known to the world. Jesus prays for unity in the mission of glorifying and making God's name known to the world. John 17, 20 through 26. I do not ask for these only. These are the, he's talking about just the ones that he has physically right there, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. That they may be all as one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, and that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given to me because you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know you that have sent, know that you have sent me. And I made known to them your name. And I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may it be in them and I in them. Jesus is going to make his name known through the church through the unity of the church. And he is praying and saying, God, please bring your people together under my authority. Bring your people together to be united in the mission. It's very interesting. The, being united in the mission is so important to anything in life. We learned a lot about the Revolutionary War, and we understood as we were learning about that in Boston that there were many, many people who were fighting against each other that were all kind of on the same side but just saw things differently and how hard that made things at points. But the idea here, when we're thinking about the mission of God, it takes all of us together to bring the gospel to the nations. If we are too busy fighting, bickering, uh, worrying about what happens inside these walls and, and, and we're not 
uh, going out as a community to reach the people of this world with the gospel, if we are not united in our mission, if we are not united in our hearts, then it's going to be very hard for the world to see the glory of Christ through his church. But Jesus prays and says, I pray for the church that as they are one, as they are one in mission, that mission is to make disciples through my authority. If they are one in that way, that we will see the world know Jesus. It's very simple. What I want to say here is this. God's primary way of making his name known is the church living like the church. Jesus has called us as his people to live like the church, to live like we know him, to live like we love him, to live like we love one another because we should and do love one another. And as we love one another in unity, his word will go forward. The gospel will pursue, go forward, and people will be saved. But let's look at the second thing Jesus does. Not only does he pray for us uh, in his authority for protection and for our unity, but Jesus promises power to the church. He promises us power, and we must trust in his promises. If we want to persevere in the mission, we need to trust in Jesus. Trust that he knows what's best. First of all, we're going to see that Jesus promised his disciples that the gospel would go to all nations. I want us to look at Luke 24, 46 through 49. Um, and uh, to start, we're just going to look at the first couple verses here in uh, verses 46 uh, and 47. But, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day, rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So that's what we're told in Luke 24. Same author tells us in a little bit of a different way in Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and watch this, and to the end of the earth. Through Luke 24, 46 and 47, and Acts 1, 8, we see something very, very clear, that Jesus promised his disciples that the gospel would go to all nations. It's not our work, but his. He has promised it, and he will accomplish it. You see, the gospel going forward and disciples being made at the end of the day has been promised by Jesus. It's going to happen. The question is, is will we join in that process or will we not? But we're going to get to that in a moment. How is it that we do participate in this process? Well, it becomes very clear as we see Jesus' promises. Not only does he promise that the gospel will go forward, but he promises that we're going to be a part of it. We see that as we continue on in Luke chapter 24. Jesus proclaimed that the church are his witnesses to the gospel. That the church are his witnesses to the gospel. The church is his witness. But as plural, we are all his witnesses. Luke 24, 46 through 49. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day, rise from the dead, that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Acts 1, 8. But you will all receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. What is our role as Jesus is going to bring the gospel? He says, I promise you, the gospel will go to all the earth, and it's going to go through you as my witnesses. Now, I said this a few years ago. I don't know how long ago it was. And this has been one of the things for me that has transformed how I think about, uh, really, the commands of Scripture. What we see here, a lot of times we, we, we kind of look at these verses and we say, look, you need to go and you need to be a witness. Go be a witness. And yes, we need to go be a witness, but we're already actually told that we are witnesses. This isn't about what we do, but it's about who we are. Jesus, through his authority and what he has done and the fact that he is saving the world through his gospel, has said to us as his church, if you are a follower of Jesus, you are his witness. You don't have an option. This isn't a... Uh, I can choose to be a witness or I can choose not to be. This is, hey, if you know Jesus, you're a witness. You are a witness through the way you live. You're a witness through the way you speak. Like, this is what God promises. He says, listen, this, the gospel is going to go forward and you're going to be my witnesses. There's no way out of this. Okay, we are all witnesses. We are all together witnessing to the gospel of Jesus so that people will come to know Jesus, so that they will be made into disciples of Jesus. But not only does he promise that the gospel will go forward, does he not only promise that we are his witnesses, but he promises that he will provide the power 
for this. He will provide the power for the mission through the Holy Spirit. Again, going to Luke 24 and Acts 1-8 again. Uh, Jesus promises that he will provide power through his Holy Spirit. Luke 24, 46 through 49, after he says that the gospel is going forward, that we are witnesses of these things, and he says, And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So where's this power coming from? Acts 1-8 tells us exactly where this power is coming from. And, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Again, we cannot forget that the power to be witnesses is not in ourselves. The power to be witnesses is in the Holy Spirit. God himself who dwells in us that Jesus left and gave us so that we could be witnesses for the truth. So that we can make disciples not in our power but in his power. And so if we are struggling with perseverance, we lean into the Holy Spirit. We lean into God and we say, we know that God, you are working in me and through me because you dwell in me, that God, you are working in me. And that is the power that we have. We are witnesses because he has made us witnesses and he has given us the power to be witnesses through the Holy Spirit. And we see that truth here in Acts 1-8 and in Luke 24. Again, we do not fulfill the purpose of missions without the power of God dwelling in us. So Jesus not only prays for the church and promises power to the church, but now we're going to see that Jesus also produces through the church. He prays, he promises, and now he produces through the church. We're going to see that in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is where after people first receive Jesus, we see them forming the very first what we would call organized church. Then we're going to see what happens as they come together. But... Let's talk about Acts chapter 2. Uh, in verses 1 through 41, and I'm not going to read this whole passage this morning for time's sake, but in Acts 2, 1 through 41, we actually see Jesus fulfills his promise, the gospel is preached, and 3,000 people are converted. Indeed, we see in Acts chapter 2, we see the Holy Spirit comes to his disciples. He comes and empowers them to go forward and preach the gospel in different languages to people who are listening. This is uh, a missions rally. At, at, at It's the very first one in many ways. So there's people from all over the world who are there. And they, the disciples go out and they speak the gospel and people are hearing it in their own language. It's an amazing, miraculous event. The Holy Spirit comes into his people and they start to preach the gospel. By the way, that's the point of the Holy Spirit, is to draw attention to Jesus. And that's what he's doing here. They're preaching the gospel through the power that God has given. So we see that Jesus has fulfilled his promise in Acts 2, 1 through 41. And what do we see as the result of that? Well, let's look at just verses 40 and 41. And with many other words, he, this was Peter at this point, bore witness and continued to exhort them. This is after he shared the gospel, what Jesus has done and who he is, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word, that's received the gospel, were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. First day, the Holy Spirit comes, church goes out, 3,000 people. By the way, again, and I know Pastor Justin has said this many times, when we see this, there was added to them about 3,000 souls. Who's doing the adding? Well, we are, getting, we are understanding that through the passive voice that God is doing the adding. God is adding 3,000 souls as the gospel is preached by his people through the power of the Holy Spirit. We see that happening in Acts chapter 2, uh, that whole section, 1 through 41, and this is where it ends. People give their lives to Jesus after hearing the gospel. Because Jesus fulfilled his promise. But again, Jesus, through his promise, it is God who is providing the increase here. It's not because people twisted people's arm to make them say, yeah, I want to become a Christian. They preached the gospel and people knew Jesus, came to know Jesus. Now, let's continue on in Acts chapter 2. And what we're going to see is after this initial uh, outpouring of the Spirit, the outpouring of people coming to know Jesus, the church continues to live out the gospel and the Lord continues to add more people. The church continues to live out the gospel, and the Lord adds more people. Acts 2, 42 through 47. This is what we see the first church doing as they come together. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as many had need. 
And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. There's a couple of key truths here that I want to focus in on. The church continues to live out the gospel, and so the Lord adds more people. As we see, as what was told to us, in, as Jesus prayed in John 17, he said, allow the church to be one so that the world will know me and the world will know you and that, he, that you sent me. Is that what's what Jesus prayed for? We're seeing it happen in Acts 2, 42 through 47. The church, the people of God, the people who believe in Jesus are coming together and they're learning and they're praying and they're breaking bread together. They're fellowshipping with each other. There are incredible things happening. They believe together. They share together all of these things are happening and they're praising God and as they praise God they're having favor with the people they're they they are known to they're receiving things with glad and generous hearts they are living out the gospel they are living in light of what Jesus has done for them and it's transformed their lives as the church comes together as they're meeting in homes as they're going to the temple to worship God together as the church is being the church what do we see happening People are getting saved. Notice this isn't that, oh, we've sent out five new missionaries that went out to share the gospel and people got saved. No, this was the church as a whole, working together, following Jesus together, showing the world what Jesus, who Jesus is and what he's done, and no doubt preaching the gospel while they do it. And as that happens, people get saved. But keep in mind, what are we told here in verse 47? It doesn't say, and people were preaching the gospel and they converted people. No, it says, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. We can't forget that the power of salvation comes only through the Lord. It only comes through the power of Jesus. It only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. It only comes as people hear the gospel and God saves their soul. We can't manufacture this. We can't force people into this. This has to be a work of God in the heart of man. But we see it happening and God is using the church in the mission to bring people to know Jesus and to make disciples that will continue to make disciples of all the nations. <clears throat> Third thing, as we think about Jesus producing through the church, he produces as, pe- as the word is preached, he produces as the church lives out their life as the church. We, all, we also now see we all have a part to play, but it is only God who produces salvation. I've already said that, but I want to go to another passage that shows us this. We all have a part to play, but it is only God who produces salvation. We are not in charge of who gets saved and who doesn't. 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 9 was written by Paul to a Corinthian church who were were fighting over basically who it is that they should be following. And Paul is correcting that. And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 9. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants or he who waters is anything. But only God gives who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. What is Paul saying here? It's very, very clear that people getting saved is not about who preaches to them, but it's about who does the saving, which is God himself. He talks about the fact that there is watering, that there is, uh, there's planting, there's watering. Uh, one, the the book we were doing downstairs for a while with the men's group, uh, uh, Street Smarts, he, he, said, he calls it, Greg Kokel calls it gardening. We're all part of gardening. Now I hate gardening in real life, but, uh, let's, uh, but gardening here is about planting seeds of the gospel, watering those seeds of the gospel by preaching the good news and living out the good news. And as we do that, we then step back and let God be the one that actually brings the harvest. We're not in charge of harvesting what is there. We're not in charge. We're not in control. We don't have the authority to to make people into Christians. The only way people will come to know Jesus and grow, what we're told here very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul reminds everyone that it is not about the planter or the waterer. It's not about the gardeners. We are called to garden, and we should do that whenever we have opportunity. That's the labor that we do. We labor by looking for opportunities to be good gardeners, but at the end of the day, it's not about the gardener. It's just like in a real garden. You can, we've tried this at home. We've 
uh, mostly my wife. She's done everything she's supposed to do to get things to grow, and yet they never grow. I think it's a uh, you know, black thumb thing. I'm not sure, but whatever is going on there. But the point is, you can garden well and still not get a crop because it's not up to you what grows. Here's the truth of spiritual gardening. We garden. We water. We plant. We give the gospel. We live for the gospel. And then we let God do the rest of the work and, and people will become saved through his work and not our own. Because again, we're part of God's field, God's building, not our own field, not our own building, but his. Brings us to our conclusion then. So, so far what we've seen is that we have a purpose, that is to make disciples of all nations, that he's given us the power to do that. He has reminded us of that through praying for us, through promising us power, and through producing, producing believers. We've seen it happen and we continue to see it happen. So we trust that, God is, that Jesus has prayed for us, that he promises things to us, and that he produces through us. And if we trust in all of those things, then we know the purpose of making disciples, we must persevere, and that's where we end our time this morning. And we, as the church, must persevere. We must keep on keeping on in sharing the gospel, in gardening, in living for the gospel, preaching the gospel, being uh, lights of the gospel for God to use in his power to bring people to know Jesus. That is the goal of missions. Whether it's across the world, whether it's in your home, whether it's in your school, whether it's in your community, wherever it might be, wherever God has you, you are a gardener. And God can use you in those capacities if we are simply open to looking for every opportunity to bring the gospel to bear in our lives. So we must persevere. And let's look at a few passages that remind us of this. First of all, I want to just encourage everyone here. This is where we get encouragement because it's going to get hard. There are times that it's going to be hard. We need to be encouraged. And how are we going to be encouraged? The Bible says there's several things that we can cling to. First of all, we see that we must keep on sowing good, waiting for God to bring the reaping. Again, we must continue to garden, waiting for God to bring the harvest. So as we sow, we wait for God to reap. But for Galatians 6, 6 through 10. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. And the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Again, that's the work of the Spirit. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. And especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now, I understand this passage isn't specifically about evangelism or sharing the gospel to unbelievers. It's actually talking a lot about how we should treat others in the church. But keep in mind that as we live out our lives as the church, others will come to know Jesus. But I think it, as just by principle, we can see what God is saying here is don't give up in doing good because the reaping is coming. But remember, the, the goal here, he talks about the Holy Spirit being the one who reaps eternal life. Right? So we continue to sow. We continue to work by gardening, by living out the gospel, by preaching the gospel, by doing good, as we're told here in this passage. Well, what is the ultimate good? The ultimate good is to live and share the gospel. That's the ultimate good. Not just by being a good person in the world's eyes, but by truly following Jesus with our lives. And as we do that, in due season, there will be a reaping. And that reaping will come and the harvest will come, but we need to be patient. We need to not lose, we need to not grow weary but we need to trust God, trust in his promises, know that he's prayed for us, know that he produces and we don't. And that should give us encouragement as we go into the hard things of life. So not only do we persevere but by keep sowing good and waiting for God to do the reaping, we also, we also look here that we need to keep living for the sake of the gospel. And I've said this several times, but I want to look at this. I want to look at how Paul viewed his life. How did Paul view his life going back to the book of 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 26? It says this, For I am free from all, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became was one under the law, although not myself being under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I may win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. 
Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. Paul tells us how he lives his life and how we should live our lives, and that is as a runner running to receive the prize. The prize that we are running to see is, the, is people to know Jesus, that, that the kingdom of Christ will come in our lives and in our hearts. And so we look forward to that and we run towards that, but what Paul says is in the midst of that, he will make whatever sacrifices he needs to make, he will do whatever it takes, he will do whatever it takes. This is the goal here. This is what I want us to really think through is that we need to live for the sake of the gospel the way Paul did. Just like Paul, we need to live a whole life devoted to doing whatever it takes to see the gospel spread. That's what he says. He says everything that he talked about. He says, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. Now, there's lots of goals that we live for in our life. And they're not all bad. And I'm not saying we don't pursue good goals in this life. But at the end of the day, what Paul lived for and really what we all need to live for is that ultimately we do all things. Everything we do is for the sake of the gospel for, so that people will see and hear about Jesus Christ and give their lives to him. That is mission's work. That is the purpose of the church. Again, wherever we are and whatever we're doing, we do it all for the sake of the gospel as Paul did knowing that he was running a race and that we are in that same race, that we persevere to get to the end, that we persevere through continuing to live for the gospel. And finally, I want to look at this. We do everything, and this, these are all linked, I get that, but we do everything for God's glory. We do everything in our lives for God's glory. As we live out the gospel, that means we are living for God's glory. We do everything for God's glory so that people may be saved. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 through 33. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now many of us, when we read this verse, we stop there. It's a good verse to pull out and just have as one verse. We need to do everything, whether we eat or drink, to the glory of God. That is true. But follow with me now as we go to these next couple verses. Because what is the point of bringing glory to God? Not just that you can feel good about yourself because you have brought glory to God, but there's a purpose. It goes back to the purpose we talked about to begin with. It says this, So whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage. Now watch this. But that of many, that they may be saved. Why do we live a, glor- a life that glorifies God? Why do we go to other countries all around the world to share the gospel of Jesus and show his glory to the nations? Why do we seek to show his glory to our workplace? Why do we seek to show his glory to our school? Why do we seek to show his glory to our community, to our families? Why is it that he says, whatever you do, whether you eat or you drink, whatever you're doing in your life, you do it all for the glory of God? Why? Why? It's here so that the many may be saved. So that the purpose of making disciples in the authority of Jesus would happen. So don't lose the point of what we've been saying today or even this popular verse. We live to show God's glory to those around us and as that happens, God will use us as a tool for him to save people. As we take all of this together, we see that the job of missions is yes, in one sense, a responsibility that we have, but in a whole other sense, it is a promise that we've been given. It's not just what we do, it's who we are. It's not just what we have to obey, but it's what God has given us to do, and he's given us the power to do that, and so we trust in him. Missions is not a work of the few, it is the work of all of us. But we do remember God is in control of it all, and we are called simply to live out the gospel in word and in deed. Glorify God and then let God do what he does best, which is to save people We must trust in him and his promise that the gospel will go out to the world and save people. He has promised it and he will bring it to completion. Now I will say this, that even in the midst of knowing this promise that Jesus is saving people, sometimes this world gets confusing. We're confused by God and his timing and what he does and why he does it. But we need to trust that God is in control, that he is bringing people to know Jesus all around the world. Every nation hearing the gospel 
as we live out, as we preach, as missionaries go out, as missionaries stay in, however we look at that, we are all one in this mission of bringing the gospel to the nations, and God is going to do that. He promises that the gospel goes forward, but sometimes he does that in ways that we don't expect. We trust that he knows best no matter what, and he will fulfill his promise through his church. It's the promise we have, that's the encouragement we can take. We don't need to walk away feeling guilty because we don't preach the gospel more. What we should walk away with is encouraged to say, Jesus, I have the ability and the power to go and make disciples because you have given me the power and you have the authority in everything and therefore I will walk out of here with confidence as I share the gospel and as I live the gospel and I am truly living on mission for you. Wherever you may go, if God calls you around the world, do it. Go, share the gospel for his glory so that people will know Jesus. If, you, if you're here and you're staying and God has called you to stay, then you give and you pray and you, and you take whatever opportunity you can to garden and preach and teach the gospel through not only what you say but what you do. And then we just trust that even when we don't understand how God might be working at a moment, that he is bringing something better from any circumstance we face. He is going to use our lives for the glory of his name and to spread his name among the nations. And with that as a closing, we actually are going to have a closing song. Uh, and, and Robbie Lindmark's going to come up. He's going to sing. He's going to be sharing with us during ABF. But I want you to listen to this song in reminding ourselves that in the process of missions, God is in control, and we need to trust him no matter what. And so as you listen to this song, would you consider and contemplate that with me?